Time now for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he's just an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, American Pioneer Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, W.K. Green, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the case of Barton Drake, or how I played ducks and drakes uh, with a drake who ducked. Expense account, item one. $100 I'm charging you for one hour's sleep I missed answering your telephone call at 9 o'clock in the morning. Expense account, item two, a dollar and a half. I had to go out for breakfast. The Easter Bunny didn't leave me any eggs. Item three, cab fare to your office, one dollar. Tip to driver, one dollar. Good morning, Johnny. Why don't we make that good night sometime soon? Shall we, Chickie? Well, I've had to type up some of your expense accounts. I think maybe an evening with you might be fun. But business first. Old Stonewall's waiting for you. Oh, hasn't he gotten out of that military kick yet? <laughs> no, he still thinks he's a general. But to me, he's still just what he was before he ever went into the army. His belts never stop fighting the battle of the businessman's bulge, huh? Well, forward march. Good morning, Mr. Green, sir. Mr. Dollar reporting his order, sir. Eddie. Hmm? Oh, yeah. what's this saluting and heel clicking about? Oh, I thought you might be homesick for some military courtesy. Yeah, I'd be surprised to get any kind of courtesy from you. But we're not paying you to be polite. Sit down. Here. I got a job for you. Here. I had a copy made of the file in that case. You can take it with you. Thanks. Barton Drake, huh? Oh, yeah, I remember him. Let's see. Life insurance, $30,000. Beneficiary, Mrs. Barton Drake. Well, what is it? Is he dead or just dying? Neither, we hope. Well, if you'll pardon a little before noon philosophy, just by living, a man is slowly dying of old age. We have a statistical department to worry about that dollar. Your job is to find this man, Barton Drake. Okay. What's the story? And as far as the company is concerned, the story started one night just short of seven years ago. Oh, that would make it uh, 1942. Yes, the same year I was called upon to fight for my country. Uh, yeah. In the insurance division, Pentagon building, Washington, D.C. Huh? But don't get me wrong. Those who serve can be just as proud of what they did as those who fought. As you were saying. I merely used the word fight as a... This is a general term. Yes, General. Barton Drake, one night about uh, seven years ago? Uh, yes. When we issued the life policy on Drake, he uh, listed his occupation as that of uh, hardware store proprietor. Hardware? <laughs> as I recall it, he specialized in unregistered pistols, handcuff keys, and hacksaws. And if I'm not wrong, at the time he disappeared, he was under suspicion of grand larceny and wanted for assault with intent to kill a police officer. Yeah, that's right. At the time, he was suspected of a number of large robberies. Yeah. Refresh me on that cop shooting. How'd that happen? Uh, you remember. When the police arrived at the house to pick him up, he opened fire from the bedroom window, made a dashboard out of the back to his own car. And there was a chase during which the car skidded and went through the rail of a bridge into the river. Uh, oh, yes. Now I remember, yeah. They never did recover the body or the loot. All they got back was a wet Buick. Uh, Dollar, that was seven years ago. At least it will be seven years in one more week. At that time, Barton Drake will be declared legally dead by the probate court. His wife has already instituted proceedings. And when the court says she's a widow, she says, I want my $30,000, and you have to pay it, right? Exactly. But we're not going to pay that $30,000 if we can help it. At 9 o'clock this morning, the missing persons bureau of the New York Police Department called us and gave us reason to hope that Drake is still alive. What happened? Did they see him in a crystal ball? You don't know how close to the truth you came, Dollar. Oh? The missing persons boys have a new habit these days. 
Whenever there's a television show there's, where there's a public crowd involved, they watch it. Last night, they think they spotted Barton Drake at the prize fights. Now, that's all we've got to go on, but we think he's alive and that he's somewhere in New York. Well, that's a start, anyway. I know where to find New York. <laughs> Expense account, item four, seven dollars. Mileage, Hartford to New York. I stopped in Bridgeport to soak up a dish of coffee and whatever information there might be in the insurance file. Of the two, the coffee was the stronger. All I learned from the file was Drake's physical, physical measurements, the birthplace of his mother, his wife's maiden name, the last known quotation on his blood pressure, and his home address in Manhasset, Long Island, to which I went. The house had a $40,000 look about it, and its grounds were being manicured by a gardener who had a $12 a day look about him. Yes, sir? Uh, I'd like to see Mrs. Drake. Here's my card. Yes, sir. Get in, please. Thank you. If you wait here in the hall, sir, I'll go tell her you're here. The maid had a $40 a week look about her and completed the picture of prosperity. For a hardware merchant, Barton Drake had died leaving his wife living a soft life. Either that or he was still alive and not giving his wife grounds for divorce on the basis of non-support. Or she was that certain kind of gal who wouldn't have any trouble making that certain kind of man get up that certain kind of money. And when I saw her, I knew not only that I couldn't afford her, but the Drake probably hadn't been able to, which probably led to his undoing. Just to give you an idea, she was wearing a diamond necklace and a negligee, and it was two o'clock in the afternoon. Mr. Dollar? Mrs. Drake? Yes, Stella Drake. I'm having breakfast. Won't you come in and join me? Well, I'll join you, but uh, no breakfast. I just had a tomato surprise. Hmm? Lunch. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't mean me. Uh, come on, right in here. Are you sure you won't have some breakfast? No, thanks. I couldn't bring myself to hurt that poor, tired trout you've got there. Oh, please. That's a genuine English kipper. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't recognize it without its monocle. <laughs> oh, you're more fun than an eye-opener. I should have you around when I get up every day. Well, I have something to tell you that should make you really feel good. You don't mean that bunch of stuffed shirts at the insurance company have decided to give me my money without going through all that fuss at probate court. Oh, I've got better news than that. You may not get that money. Uh, but we think you have a good chance of getting your husband back. What? Yeah, the New York police think they saw him last night. Alive. Oh, maybe I was wrong. Maybe that doesn't make you happy. Why, uh, yes. Yes, of course, of course it makes me happy, but oh, to live without a man for seven years and then have a, a stranger just sit across the table and calmly tell you he's alive, it, it's just too much. Tell me, where did they find him? They didn't. They think they spotted him at the fights they were watching on television. I imagine they're looking for him. I know I am. Well, it's impossible. If he were alive and back in New York, he'd come to me. That's what I was hoping, Mrs. Drake. Well, I don't believe it. Why would he do a thing like that to me? Why would he make me suffer all these years? I think you'd better go now. I've got to be alone. I've got to think. Oh, Barton, why? Why? Please, Mr. Dollar. I want to be alone. I figured if she wanted to be alone, it was for a good reason. Because that lather she'd gotten into was strictly from soap opera. She flooded me to the door on a tide of tears. Once outside, I picked up the hedge clippers the gardener had conveniently left near the front walk and pruned the telephone wires leading into the house. Then I took a plant on the place from the other side of the street. I figured Mrs. Drake would want to share her troubles with somebody, and with the phone wires cut, she'd have to leave the house to do it, giving me a chance to follow her. And that's the way it worked out. She led me someplace all the way into New York City, but not to Barton Drake. That would have been too easy. Once in Manhattan, she headed for a drugstore and a telephone booth. Hello, I slipped into the phone booth beside hers. I got the receiver off the hook and my nickel in the slot in time to use an old trick of mine. As she dialed, I tried to duplicate it with my phone. She dialed. And I dialed. 
I was just one number behind her all the way. When she was through dialing, I held off dialing the last number on my phone until she got an answer. And then I let it go. The number she was calling was busy. There was still room for coincidence, but it was good enough for me. I jotted down the number I'd gotten out of my little telephone game of tag and then listened. I've got to see you right away. We're in trouble. All right, I'll meet you at 22. The usual case. <laughs> The usual place turned out to be the usual place to meet trains, Grand Central Station. But no train ever pulled into where Mrs. Drake went. As a matter of fact, no man ever did. Unless he was a plumber, maybe. That's right, where the ladies go to powder their noses and things. She came out 30 minutes later alone, but she never hit the street. Instead, she went through the tunnel into the adjoining Commodore Hotel and checked into room 407. The only room I could get was 1313. Expense account item five, ten dollars. Tip to hotel detective for keeping an eye on the Eiffel in 407. Item six, thirty-five dollars. Purchase of portable phonograph. Item seven, sixty-five cents. Purchase of phonograph record. Frank Sinatra singing night and day. With this for ammunition, I went back to my hotel room and gunning for a bird I'd never seen. I set up the phonograph near the telephone, put on the record, and placed a call to the number Mrs. Drake had called earlier in the day. Hello there, 7 p.m. again, and this is your favorite disc jockey, Happy Jack the Money Man. Yes, your favorite disc jockey, your spinner with the winners. Tell me, are you listening to our show? My radio is not on. Goodbye. Oh, hold the phone, madam. A little thing like that doesn't make any difference to Happy Jack. Here's all you have to do to win a house full of prizes. Now, you just listen closely over the phone and identify today's puzzle platter, and you'll win all these wonderful prizes. A genuine sunbeam mix master that makes those fresh little eggs just happy to get beat up. Yes, and you'll clean up with the next prize. Make a real clean sweep with a Hoover vacuum cleaner with all attachments and no strings attached. <laughs> and to send you tripping happily through life, you'll also receive a handsome set of easy-to-lug luggage, a pair of gladiator bags. Are you interested? Why, of course I am. All right, then. Here's the tune. There it is. What's the title of that song? Night and Day. You're right. You win all the sensational prizes. Quickly now, give me your name and address. They'll be delivered tonight. Mrs. Knott. Yes, Mrs. Knott. The street number? 127 East 89th Street, apartment 3C. Thank you, Mrs. Knott. You'll get the whole works immediately. <laughs> Expense account, items 8, 9, and 10. $39.50, purchase of Mixmaster. $79.50, purchase of vacuum cleaner. And uh, $89.50, purchase of luggage. You may resent this expenditure, but there's one thing you must remember. Nobody can resist trading their name and address for something for nothing. I felt like an out-of-season Santa Claus when I knocked on the door of apartment 3C at 127 East 89th Street. The frame suddenly became a picture frame encasing a live version of Whistler's grandmother, complete with wheelchair and crocheted afghan. Just bring them in and set them down. Yes, ma'am. I'm happy, Jack, and I'm glad to meet you. Right in here and set them down. Ah, yes. There you are, Mrs. Knott. You lucky woman, you. Is that all? Almost. Now all we need from you is a little information. Just some background on today's winner to pass along to my radio audience. Be off with you, young man. I'll write you a letter. Oh, but come now, Mrs. Knott. Never mind. I have no time now. Just a few questions while I check you out on the Hoover. I don't need any checking out. Now go away. I must say, Mrs. Knott, you're a bad winner. So now I'm afraid I'm going to have to stick around to find out how good a loser you are. What do you mean? Come in. Uh, you. Stella, do you know this man? Do I know him? He's that insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. Granny came flying out of the wheelchair, multiplying in height by three. When I first saw Granny's hand flying toward me, it looked like there was an old-fashioned wedding ring on each finger. But just, just too late, I saw it was only a set of brass knuckles. Oh. <laughs> 
just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. CBS cordially invites you to hear the adventures of Philip Marlowe and the stories of modern crimes and their solutions as unfolded on Gangbusters when they come to you every Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. Tomorrow night, Philip Marlowe will investigate the mystery behind the cloak of Kamehameha, and Gangbusters will deal with the case of the callous killers. Now back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> up, the thunder and lightning in my head was getting an answer from the sky. And I started getting some answers, too. You, James, give me a page. Granny's voice life. had changed to the bass register, and its owner was smoking a big a cigar. Oh, I stayed on the floor and quiet. I didn't want those brass you. knuckles crooning me another lullaby. Come off of close to fouling up the whole deal. I told you I didn't want you to try to collect on that insurance. Why'd you do it? It's $30,000, that's why. You hear you talk, you think you were going hungry. What do you think I am, some empty milk bottle you can run down to the corner and get your nickel back on? What were you trying to do anyway, sell me out? Sell you out? You know what started this trouble. You had to go to the fights last night. Oh, a big man. Dumb cops, you call them. Don't worry about me. They haven't found me. I'll take care of myself. But not with you lousing me up. Getting mixed up with dirty dealers like this guy, Dolph. Oh, you're so smart. Why did you let him in here? Shut up. He wanted to give me something for free. That's why. Well, I've got something for him. A free boat ride. Wheel that chair over here. We'll take him out in that. The wheelchair ride was short to the street. The auto ride was longer to the ocean. And from what I could gather on the dock, the boat ride was to be even longer to my doom. I was still playing Sleeping Beauty and listening to the supposed to be dead man, Barton Drake, telling his wife, Stella, how he was going to make my slumber permanent. Come on, come on, get a move on. I've got his hands tied. Hurry up with his feet. I'm almost through. There. Now what? Now I'll stand back while I heat him up on the deck. Oh. Well, aren't you going to tie him to something? For what? If they ever find this boat, they're going to find it empty. One good wave out there, and this guy goes for a swim. There. The wheel's lashed. He's got plenty of gas and plenty of ocean out there. That'll teach Mr. Happy Jack. Now I'm giving him away. <laughs> Taking that salt shower bath with my clothes on wasn't the big chill in my life. I was scared. My heart was racing faster than the boat engine. And for the first 20 minutes, all I could think about was hanging onto that slippery deck with all I had to hang with, my hopes and my heels. I was on the thin strip of deck after the wheel. Hard by my hands was a deck cleat. With that for a starting point, I went to work, trying to out-navigate that rope, with which Barton Drake had lashed the wheel. I worked my tight wrists over the cleat and dropped my legs down over the side into the icy racing water. I had rigged myself into a human jury rudder to swing the boat off its course. I didn't know where it would take me, but I didn't care so long as it wasn't out to the open sea. Might as well tell you. Your boat sunk and you ruined the dock last night doing it. You have to pay for it. Oh. My name's Fred Kindly. I pulled you off the beach. I'm expecting to be paid for that, too. Well, it cost me to find out where I am. It ain't worth nothing. Talk ain't. You're on Slate Island. It ain't worth much, neither. All Slate. Didn't have a cent to grow no chalk to go with it. Dandy. Where are my clothes? Out in the sun. How about my wallet? Uh... Fish must have got it. Mind if I feel your back for fins? Now don't get funny, young fella. Might want to be getting off this island someday. Someday? Some minute is more like it. You got a boat? Of course I got a boat, but uh, ain't got much food. 
Maybe if I could afford to buy some of supply canned goods when I got to the mainland, well, uh... Well, how much would it cost? Oh, uh, as much as a hundred dollars, maybe? Okay, it's a deal. Let's go. Uh, hold on now. Only said maybe. Come think of it, it might cost uh, two hundred. Oh, okay, you swindler. Two hundred, then. Oh, swindler, am I? I say, a fellow might as well have the game as a name. Makes my price five hundred dollars worth of great A canned goods. And if you don't want to pay it, you can get out in this shack and wait for the mailboat. Maybe I will. When does it get here? A uh, week from Tuesday. Uh, uh, okay. He'll get you $500 worth of canned goods. When can we start? I'll give you your clothes soon as you put it in writing and sign your name. Where's the paper? Uh, right here. Keep it handy. Uh, just fill in the amount here. $500 worth. It's a regular contract for shipwrecks. Okay. Give it here. 500 And where do I sign? Right there, at the bottom. There you are. All signed. Uh, that's a peculiar name. Ali Khan. I'd had more than my share of wind the night before, so I decided to throw caution to it. I went into the building at 127 East 89th Street and up to apartment 3C. First, I knocked with my knuckles and got no answer. So then I knocked with my feet. Well, what do you know? The lock broke. There was nobody home, and Barton Drake must have been out calling himself Granny at the moment because the wheelchair part of his disguise was also among the missing. The closet was empty, and the brand-new gladiator bags I had delivered the previous evening were nowhere to be found. Now, nobody could say I hadn't made it easy for Drake to make a getaway with my little giveaway. I'd even supplied the luggage. But all the traffic wasn't going. Some of it was coming. Oh, well, Stella, there's one bad thing about kicking your way into places. You can't lock the door behind you. Well, now that you're in, you better come all the way in. What are you doing here? You should be asking me what I'm doing alive. The only answer I've got for that is I don't murder easily. Where's Barton? Ah, that was the next question I was going to ask you. Now that that one's gone, I've got a couple more I'd like to ask you. And don't argue. I don't know anything. Well, then, let me tell you something. If you're not guilty of anything else, you are guilty of attempted insurance fraud. That's in my department. The tougher you make it on me, the tougher I'm going to make it on you. Now, about those questions. How long has your husband been back here in New York? He... He never left here. Oh, the night his car crashed through the bridge, he just grabbed himself a hideaway in New York and stayed put, huh? How long has he been using that old lady disguise? All the time. Okay. Well, now my last question. That bag in your hand, where were you going? Okay, let's find out. Give me that bag. Uh-huh. What's this? Well, it's either a bathing suit or a two-piece handkerchief. And that blouse there, that doesn't look like it's for dinner wear in an igloo. You were headed south. So we were headed south. What about... We, huh? If you ask me, and I doubt that you will, so I'll tell you anyway, your hope's just headed south. Lady, you've been double-crossed. Your husband took off without you. I don't believe it. If he left here, he had a good reason. That's your guess. For, for we're not playing your hunches. We're playing mine from here on in. Just where did he say you were going? I don't remember. Maybe it'll help if first you remember what I told you about insurance fraud. It's good for 10 to 20 years. Now do you remember? He bought tickets on the Orange Blossom Special for Florida. It leaves Penn Station in an hour and a half. Oh, you've got that little backwards. The Orange Blossom Special pulls out in half an hour. Huh? That doesn't even give me enough time to get down there. Get out of my way. <laughs> Sit down. Hello, information. Look, I want the telephone number of the Penn Station branch of the Traveler's Aid Society. This was once when I didn't want the society to aid the traveler. I told them that Barton Drake was my invalid aunt and as nutty as a fruitcake. With Stella's help, I described his costume from the daisies on his hat to the buttons on his shoes. I tagged it off with a warning that when my aunt left the house, she thought she was a honeybee and was on her way to throw herself in front of the Orange Blossom special wheelchair and all. The guy on the other end of the line took off to round up the railway police, and I took off to round up a taxi. Attention. Attention, please. I rode the escalator into the main waiting room, and halfway down, I spotted Barton Drake in his grandmother get up. He was surrounded by police, and the police were surrounded by a small crowd. 
I walked over. The orange blossom special. I don't know what kind of a practical joke this is, young man, but it's not funny. You made me miss my train, and I don't even have a nephew. No, no, Mother, don't be upset in yourself. Don't you now, now, me, young man. Just get me on a train. Any train headed south will do. Drake was getting ready for trouble. If the cops couldn't see it, I could. His hand was under his afghan, and I knew the least it could be holding was a fistful of brass knuckles, but probably more. He was getting ready to make a run for it. I wasn't taking any chances. I edged my way through the crowd, up behind the wheelchair, and spun it around, and hit what looked like somebody's grandmother a beautiful shot in the whiskers. Oh, he hit the old lady! I got him. Now, wait a minute, officer. You don't understand. Don't understand, don't I? Hit an old lady, will you? He's not an old lady. Uh, it's trouble you want, you scoundrel. Here, maybe this will quiet you. Oh, no. So you don't... Oh. Hiya, Chicky. Oh, that, that bandage. What's the matter with your head? No brains. Where's the general? Oh, when he found out you'd saved American Pioneer $30,000, he decided to take the morning off and celebrate. He's out playing golf. Oh, great. To celebrate my getting hit on the head with police clubs, he goes out and swings golf clubs. Oh, Johnny, I was sort of Now, don't that... worry, Chicky. I've still got enough energy left for nightclubs. You want to help me with this expense account? I'll have to get it out of the way. Oh, that's all that stands between uh -huh. us. Uh-huh. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, American Pioneer Life Insurance Company. First, the police held me and let Granny Drake go to the hospital where they learned the truth. Then they let me go to the hospital and transferred Barton Drake to the pokey where he was soon joined by his lady-in-waiting, Mrs. Drake. Uh, expense account item 11. Something I almost forgot. $500. Canned goods. For the man who got me off the rocks on Slate Island, Mr. Fred Kindly. Even if he did rob me, I didn't feel like robbing him. The only thing I did do was remove all the labels from the $500 worth of canned goods. I'm sure that this will see to it that Mr. Kindly had some very unbalanced meals because I happen to know that there's no difference in the sound of canned tomatoes and uh, canned peaches when you shake the can. Uh, expense account total, $1,482.63. Yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> At last, mankind is facing up to one of its most feared diseases, cancer. Research scientists are working tirelessly, exploring every avenue that might lead to new treatments, new cures, and new insight into the causes of the disease. At the same time, the American Cancer Society is working to keep the public informed of all the progress that has been made, trying to reach everyone with the message that the sooner a diagnosis is made, the better the chances of cure. Together, this public education and research attack should bring great progress in the control of cancer. But both phases of this program are costly. Realizing you are giving to a fight against a disease that could menace you, give generously to the American Cancer Society's Drive for Funds this year. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Charles Russell as Johnny. Our music is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System.